Okay, it's another bath day for this big beautiful girl. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how much work these things are. If you're new to keeping reticulated pythons, you happen to stumble across these videos. Or if you're thinking about keeping a reticulated python, just how much work are they? Well, if you buy a baby, they're really not that much work as a youngster. You get yourself a small, I don't know, 20, 40 gallon tank. You set it up the proper way so that it holds the right amount of humidity and heat. <clears throat> and then that's gonna serve you for about three, four months maybe. Depending on how fast your snake grows, they all grow at different rates. Some snakes it might last five, six months. But probably six months tops. Also depends how much you feed them. Let's take a look here. This one's still in about a 20 gallon. <clears throat> it's in the shed right now. It's just simple, bare bones, basic setup. I throw a towel or in this case a shirt over the top. You got a water dish. And that, whoa, that scared the shit out of me. You got a roach running by here. Somebody's escaped. Oh, I missed him. Well, somebody's not going to be happy about that. Anyway, that helps hold the humidity humidity in. You don't want your screen top to be completely open. It dries out a little too easily. And this will serve the snake for about, this particular snake, maybe three or four months. Then she'll be upgraded to one of these style enclosures. I hope to replace these someday too. Build a bigger walk-in enclosure. Anyways, that's beside the point here. That's all work for later on down the road. But once they start to grow, say they're more like this size, they're still pretty manageable. You can uh, still carry this snake around pretty easy. Snake's about 10 feet long, maybe 15 pounds. Not exactly sure on her weight. <clears throat> Somewhere around there. Still fairly easy to manage. When they get to this size though, they're quite heavy. I'm guessing this girl's probably somewhere around 90 to 100 pounds now. She's quite heavy. But you don't have to uh, really manhandle these things. Um, you kind of learn how to work with the snake and guide it. and Just kind of direct it so that you're not fighting with it or having to lug a bunch of weight around. I mean, unless you really have to transport your snake somewhere. There's not a whole lot of times when you're going to have to bear the full weight of this snake on you. If you plan things out correctly. If you don't, then maybe you will. You know? Don't have it to where you have your snake upstairs somewhere and <laughs> your bathing area downstairs somewhere. And it might add a lot of extra work to your schedule, your routine. But in terms of like cleaning, Probably looking on average of once a day after feedings. If you feed a decent sized meal, they go to the bathroom like once a day for about seven to ten days. And you'll be cleaning up snake pee once a day. If you have it set up like mine, you might not have to get down, not just on your hands and knees, but on your belly. Get back in those corners and scrub and mop everything out. Middle cage, slightly easier. Top cage, 
probably the easiest. You still have to get back there. If you're shorter, you might have to get a stool or something. I've got pretty long arms, so I can get back there really easy. I'm tall though, so getting down on my hands and knees and belly to clean this bottom cage is kind of a workout. A yoga workout. That's probably the hardest part. Other than that, getting them out for exercise is the most uh, time demanding part. These snakes are active and they like to come out. Unless you've got a giant 15, 20 foot walk-in enclosure where they can just roam and exercise on their own. You gotta take these guys out. You kind of have to look at these enclosures more as like their bedroom. Well, they're <clears throat> well, where they'll spend majority of their time, but they're not going to want to be confined to these uh, little spaces. They're going to want to come out and explore. So you have to afford them that opportunity. And right now this girl's come out, she's just sitting in her bath. At some point she'll get tired of sitting in her water. And sometimes she'll just let herself back up into her cage. I don't even have to do anything. Other times she'll come out, curl up over here, curl up over in that room somewhere. And I'll have to escort her back in. <clears throat> but really if you can have the discipline to stick to one reticulated python, it's doable. It's doable. If you're the right person for this kind of pet. This is assuming you are. If you're not the right person for this kind of pet, it's, uh, you know, it's no longer a work of passion. It's gonna feel like work. If you really like these animals, it doesn't really feel like work. It feels like a reward almost to be working with these guys. So, one reticulated python, it's not that labor intensive. Um, it does demand some time though. Most of that is, like I said, when you just have to get them out for their exercise. That's the most time demanding part. Cleaning, when I clean this girl, I could get her cleaned in about 12 to 15 minutes. Pull her out, get her in the tub. Wipe everything down. I keep it nice and simple so I can just wipe everything down right away. Cleans out really nice and easy. You can do bedding if you want. If you want to do wood chips, you wouldn't have to clean as often. The wood chips will soak up most of the urates. You just kind of spot clean the main bulk of the mess. And then change the wood chips out every however many months. Just go by feel, I guess. Maybe every two or three months. That'll be a little bit more labor intensive if you have to clean out all the wood chips and whatever you're using. Cypress mulch or bark. But you have to clean your snake less often. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Bit of a trade-off. Less frequent cleanings, but when you do have to clean, it's a more intense cleaning. Might save you time in the long run. Probably will. <sighs> I like to have things cleaned out ASAP though, so I do it this way for now. I might switch to wood chips in the future if I build a bigger enclosure. A bigger walk-in enclosure, which I do have plans to do. So this is just kind of the day-to-day goings on that go into keeping a retic. Obviously if you're gonna build custom enclosures that's gonna take some time and a little bit of skill. A little bit of mental work planning it all out and executing it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be functional, you know. It just has to be functional. It'd be nice if it's aesthetically pleasing. I think these aren't terrible. They're not terrible, but 
they're not the most gorgeous things. <clears throat> when I build their new enclosures, it's going to be a lot more uh, focus on making them look aesthetically pleasing. For now, these get the job done. Other than that, it's just uh, staying safe. These snakes are very intelligent, so they kind of do get uh, easy to interact with, but you never want to let your guard down. You never want to get complacent. That's kind of a difficult thing, because they are so... Uh, I don't want to say friendly, but... Just non-threatening most of the time. They're just kind of chill. But never let your guard down. Always keep read on your animal. Never put yourself in a position where if the snake did do something, you'd be severely compromised. Like if you're cleaning cages, don't just ignore your snake and clean your snake with it still in the cage. Because if it, if it bites you and wraps you up out here, you have a better chance of wrangling and wrestling the snake. But if you're caught in a compromised position and it gets you in some kind of a chokehold up here, and you're stuck, and you can't push the snake up higher than whatever this ceiling height is, you will be in a severely compromised position. And if you're stuck in this, and the snake's got you pinned in here, wouldn't be good. So don't put yourself in compromised positions. Always follow the rules. Break your snake's feeding response when first going into the cage. The hook or some sort of instrument. Doesn't have to be a fancy snake hook. It could be a broom handle. It could be like what I use. Where's my snake stick? Just a little walking stick I carved out myself that I use for tapping snakes and directing them. Soft, blunt edges, nothing that's going to harm the snake. That's pretty much it. I mean, feedings, pay extra caution during feedings. Feedings, uh, they don't take too much work. You know, you get the rodent out, maybe the night before, have it out defrosting, then the next night. See what your snake's up to, and go by the proper protocols, feeding your snake. Uh, each snake's feeding response is a little different, their feeding habits. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty much the same. Pretty much. Some snakes don't have much of a feeding response, and you just kind of got to leave the rodent in there, and they'll come and gobble it up when you're not looking. All of mine though have heavy feeding responses, which is what I prefer. I don't like a waiting or guessing game. I want them to eat, slam the prey item and devour it right away. That way I'm good to go. I don't have to wonder if I'm gonna have to refreeze something or toss something out because it's no longer good feed it to somebody else and juggle that, who's getting two meals, and then <laughs> your schedule gets all thrown off. So alongside the workload, there is a little bit of a learning curve. There is a bit of a learning curve. It's nothing that if you're severe or severe, if you're seriously passionate about these snakes, you can't handle. There's way more uh, resources out there now than there was 20 years ago. And you basically just get a retake and it'd be either wild caught or close to wild caught. And you just kind of had to figure it out for yourself. <laughs> a lot more resources, a lot more people doing this now to kind of pick their brains on. Anyways video is getting long enough. Any questions you can ask.
that's gonna be it for now. See ya.